Um, so we'll, we'll get started. Um, our last talk of the day is David Favero from the University of Minnesota and the University of Alberta. Um, and he'll be talking about cohomological field theories from GLSMs. Thanks for joining us. Right, uh, uh, thank you very much uh, for the introduction and to the uh, organizers for inviting me here to speak. Uh, I, I suppose it's uh, fairly late for you guys, but it's uh, seven in the morning for me and it's still dark outside. Um, so uh, from my basement in Minneapolis, uh, yeah, I'd like to talk to you about cohomological field theories uh, from gauged linear sigma models. Okay. So I'll tell you a little bit about, uh, to, today this is uh, part one. <laughs> Sorry, just set up my screen a little better. Sorry. I'm, I'm writing P for part one. Part one. And I should say this is uh, based on uh, joint work uh, with Bumshig Kim, who um, very tragically passed away last year, uh, right after we finished uh, this project. Uh, he was a great friend and collaborator and uh, it was a terrible loss. Um, and he's responsible for a lot of what I'm gonna tell you about. And it's also, um, I'm also going to talk about there was really two joint projects here. And uh, this was also with Kim, but also with Chio Khan unit, Chio Khan Fontenine, Jeremy Guerre, uh, Bumshig, and Mark Shoemaker. So uh, if there's any questions, uh, please interrupt me. I hope I don't have trouble hearing you or anything like that. I, I also, I'm trying to monitor the chat as well. So uh, I'm going to talk about today, I'm gonna to talk about um, GLSMs. What are they? It's the near sigma models. Uh, what are cohomological field theories? Some examples. And the history of the construction of cohomological field theories from GLSMs. And then probably uh, tomorrow evening for you, morning for me, I'll talk about uh, the construction. So uh, GLSM stands for gauged linear, gauged linear sigma model. Uh, it's a term from theoretical physics, but um, I'm gonna think of it roughly for most of this talk as an approximation, uh, which is a, uh, a GIT quotient, I'll say, a little more about what that is in a second, very briefly. A GIT quotient of affine space uh, with a global function. So you can also sometimes call this something like a Landau-Ginsberg model you get, which is V, you write the GIT quotient. This is some space of G orbits. V is a vector space. This is some kind of set of G orbits in that vector space. And uh, it's mapping by some function. We'll do it over the complex numbers. And uh, we require that uh, this is smooth. And more precisely, it's a Deline Mumford stack. 
smooth balloon muffler stack. Uh, and, and I'll be more precise in a moment about what this requirement means. And then uh, that the critical locus of this function, so inside this orbit space, the DIT quotient is proper. We'll do some examples later. So um, the data for the GLSM then is V, G, theta, and W. I haven't told you what these are, right? So V is uh, a complex vector space. Uh, G for now is just a subgroup of GLV. So it acts on this vector space, or you can think of this vector space as a G representation. And uh, theta is a character. So this is the rough, again, approximation. I'll give you the precise data uh, in a moment, but this is, uh, this is basically how we can think about it. And so now W is just a function uh, on this orbit space, right? So that comes from the data of W in just an invariant. So this is a polynomial function on V and it's G invariant. Okay, any questions? Okay, so that's just the data that for a GLSM. And we can think about it as uh, some kind of special type of uh, variety or space or manifold uh, with a function on it. Uh, just to be slightly more specific, I'll say uh, briefly, uh, what I mean by GIT quotient, because I really mean the stack here. So um, given this character theta, you can define a subset, an open subset of, of this vector space. So you look at vectors B uh, such that uh, there exists uh, f of x, a polynomial function, uh, which is not G invariant, but G semi invariant. So with respect to theta. So that means that if I look at X, uh, F of G dot X, I get some power of theta twisting this function. Um, you can think about this as a section of, of a power of the line bundle associated with theta. And, um, and we require that this function is non-zero at this point. So there needs to exist an invariant function where this function is non-zero. This is an open condition. This gives you an open subset of V and I can take the quotient. And uh, in doing so, I, I usually remove kind of the points with bad stabilizers. So I get a nice orbit space. Um, this is called the GID quotient. And we're going to view it as a stack, but you can just think about it as the orbit space. It's a quotient stack. It's open inside uh, this quotient stack. All right. So uh, if you don't like that, which maybe you do, but if, uh, there's lots of uh, nice examples. So you have, for example, uh, projective space. Not 
well, yeah, projective spaces, uh, Grassmannians. I don't mean projective varieties, I just mean projective spaces, PN, uh, Grassmannians. Or more generally, you have all uh, semi projective torque varieties. I'm taking uh, diagonal subgroups of, of GLV. Uh, or more generally than that, you have uh, quiver varieties. Okay. And uh, so those are just some nice examples. And then um, when we throw, that's without, uh, that's just the GIT quotient. When we throw in this function W, uh, that has the advantage that um, these, this GLSM data can, can vary so that the theory of it, whatever that means, the co you know, the, um, conformal field theory of it, if you like, uh, specializes to, for example, uh, complete intersections. Uh, technically special types of complete intersections uh, in all of the above. And, and maybe I'll explain that momentarily. And uh, what's sometimes called quantum singularities. So this is the case where um, G is finite. And then W is a map from a finite quotient of, of the vector space to C. You don't have to add any stability. And this has an isolated singularity. Uh, this is sometimes called a quantum singularity. So uh, forgetting about, uh, th this is kind of a useful thing to study in a lot of subjects because it specializes to sort of geometry, Kähler geometry and singularity theory. And um, maybe I hope to learn more from Melissa, but uh, by varying theta here, you can sometimes interpolate uh, between these two types of theories and, and get some relationship. Uh, so, yeah. So let me do a couple of examples. So first, let me tell you how to specialize to uh, complete intersections inside these GIT portions. So I like I, I'm already given the data of of this of this base, right? And, and I want to add a complete intersection in it. So I want to think about that as the zero section of a vector bundle on this base. So I need to choose a vector bundle. Well, I can do that by choosing a really a special kind which is a G representation. So I want a vector bundle, which comes from a G representation. Okay. And then I need a section of that bundle that corresponds to an element uh, So if I tensor uh, the coordinate ring on V by W, a G invariant element of that is a section of this bundle. So uh, as I was saying, what does that give you? That gives you a vector bundle, total space of W, which uh, projects down your base and a section. And another way to view it, 
that section is that um, if you look at the dual bundle pairing with that section, gives you actually a function on the total space of the dual bundle. Global function. Okay, so now this is actually looking itself like a GLSM again. So, in other words, we can we can form the GLSM data v plus w dual is our space. We have the same group g, which makes this into an equivariant bundle over the space. Um, we take the same character theta. And now we throw in this function, which came from the section. So those are the four uh, pieces of data I have in my GLSM. And uh, what that gives me uh, as a theory, if you like, is the zero set of that section, which lives inside. So that's our complete intersection. The zero set of this section, we have this section of this bundle. The zero set is a complete intersection in this, assuming the, the section is regular, uh, which we want to do. Okay. Any questions? So I just told you um, if I if I give you all of this, if I give you this data in addition to the affine G GIT quotient, I can, I can form a GLSM, which corresponds to the complete intersection. So uh, just uh, for, uh, I don't know, for the sake of experts, I'll just tell you the, um, the precise data, which is slightly more technical or you know, just slightly more structure, and uh, it will it won't come into play too much today. Uh, it will probably come back into play tomorrow, and I'll probably remind you about it a bit more. So uh, again, this is a maybe I'll change it a bit. This is a C vector space. But now uh, gamma is a subgroup of GLV, which uh, really I require that this is linearly reductive group. Uh, I have a character and it has to be surjective. Um, omega actually should be a section of, should be an element of sim v dual twisted by this character. And the variant. So if you forget this character, you got what I had before. Oh, sorry, uh, gamma and variant. And then nu is uh, what's called a good lift of theta is a Q character. So I just want to give you the impression of what, what actually goes into this to be precise. So uh, from this data, you can recover uh, the G I was talking about before. It's the kernel of this guy. So, so this that means that um, this group here is an extension of G 
phi C star. This extension is called R charge. And uh, theta is the restriction of this uh, lifted character to G. Uh, so that's the honest, uh, that's the honest data that goes into this uh, mechanism. And then uh, requiring that this GIT quotient is a smooth Lewy Mumford stack amounts to saying that uh, the semi-stable locus of this character, well, first of all, the good lift property is that the semi-stable locus uh, didn't change. And then you require that this is the stable locus. So this is this is what this is the condition for which we call uh, this new uh, a good lift. So and then uh, as before, we require that the critical locus of this function is proper. And that's inside, uh, again, the quotient of this space by G. All right, so what? that's the honest data. Uh, I'll remind you about it tomorrow. But you can stick with the original data I gave you, I believe, for the rest of today. Any questions? Okay, so uh, uh, what, we're, what we're interested in, uh, what uh, Bumshig and I were interested in was uh, to produce a enumerative theory for GLSMs. And this has a long history. It's not, we were not the first to be interested in this. And I, I in, in some ways it began with Witten or a Fon Jarvis Ruan. Um, but uh, we wanted to produce this theory in general for uh, GLSMs and, and I'll review the history uh, in a moment. So uh, why do this? Well, as I was saying, um, GLSMs specialize to uh, geometric theories like complete intersections. So this will, if I can produce an enumerative theory for GLSMs, this will specialize uh, to gromov witten theory. Or at least we hope for, and I'll, and I'll be more precise about what we know later for complete intersections. In affine GIT questions. Okay. So things like, recall this is things like projective space, torque varieties, Grassmannians, curve varieties. And uh, if we consider the quantum singularity, this will specialize to. Von Jarvis Ruan Witten theory, FJRW theory. So quantum singularity. So that's again G is finite. And we have something like this some isolated singularity, some function of an isolated singularity at the origin. Quasi homogeneous function to be precise. All right. And then um, varying theta should uh, interpolate between the above. And there's uh, lots of evidence for this. Okay. So uh, let me say what I mean by varying theta should interpolate 
from the above. This is the classic example called the um, landau ginsburg Calabiao correspondence sometimes, or some kind of uh, variation, LG Fano correspondence, depending on the on, on the degree of D. So uh, we can just let um, our group G be C star, and it's just going to scale uh, this C to the M plus one with uh, these weights all ones and then minus D, okay? So uh, you can imagine what happens. If I forgot about this P and I took the GIT quotient, this is all, this is just the usual scaling action on my vector space here. And I'm gonna get projective space. So if I take uh, here the identity character, then in fact, this minus D gives me the total space of O of minus D on PN. And now when I throw in a, a function f, pairing with that function uh, in this model just is, is really, um, I'm compactifying pairing with that function across the uh, unstable locus, which just means take p times f, where p is this coordinate here, okay? So when I uh, look at this function on the GIT quotient, I'll get the pairing with that. Uh, so as I said previously, this is the total space of a bundle. My function is a homogeneous polynomial of degree D. I get this hypersurface for that function in PN. And so the gromov witten theory of that hypersurface is encoded in this GLSM data. Uh, this is V, this is G, uh, and this is theta, and this is W. Okay. But uh, now if I change to the minus character, so inversion, meaning I'm taking T to T inverse, right? Then the, um, what happens is that this, this variable uh, gets inverted. In other words, uh, we, we remove zero from this last coordinate. Okay, and then when we take uh, C star orbits, we basically remove this and we get affine space back. So we get uh, a n plus one, but actually because of this minus D, we couldn't exactly quote, cancel that C star and we get a residual um, action of finite cyclic group of order D. Okay. And well, this F was already a function here. Since P was inverted, it goes away. And we just get a function F. Uh, here. So we got the quantum singularity by taking by taking this character, we actually got a quantum singularity, even though we didn't start with a finite group. Uh, it it got it, it disappeared and became a finite group when we took G of this. 
And by taking this character, we got uh, Gromop Witten theory. So, so just this basic example is going to interpolate between uh, Gromop Witten and FJRW theory uh, for hypersurfaces and in, into vector space. Any questions? Oh, that's good. Thanks. Thank you. All right, so how do we want to formalize? What is an enumerative theory? Uh, well, I'm really going to formalize it in uh, in the way that Kansevich and Manin originally did. And uh, we actually followed Pandri Pantev's definition. Uh, so a conformal field theory is the following data. And I'm gonna focus on the data um, and not the axioms which you, uh, you're free to, to read. So it consists of all this data and I'm gonna tell you what all this data is in, in our situation for GLSMs eventually, okay? So, so that's gonna be our numerative theory is in a sense, this collection of data. So it's a graded, C vector space. A super commutative pairing. And a distinguished element called the unit. And uh, most importantly, a collection of maps. So for each genus G, I mean, you could just think of G as an integer, R, R as an integer, and D, let's, let's say is integer or class in yeah, class in X in our target. So I get a collection of maps to the cohomology of the moduli space of genus G curves. Okay. So this is the data. I got to give you a graded vector space, a, a pairing, a unit element, and a collection of maps from each for each R and each G, a map from uh, the Rth tensor power of this vector space to the cohomology of the moduli space of uh, genus G curves with, with the R markings. And then uh, there's a bunch of um, operations between these moduli spaces. There's natural maps between these moduli spaces. And these, uh, these functions, these are just linear functions between these two vector spaces, okay? Th these collections of linear functions have to satisfy a bunch of axioms, which say uh, they're compatible with all the natural operations and gluings of these moduli spaces. So uh, an example is gromov witten theory. So I've mentioned it, but uh, a little more about what that is in this, uh, in this context as a cohomological field theory. So um, for gromov witten theory, we look at some smooth variety, Z or um, Taylor manifold. Um, this is the algebraic version. So 
you consider the moduli space of maps from curves into Z. So we want to study, we want to basically count curves mapping into this Z, all right? So we look at this moduli space of maps. Um, then this H, which is called the state space, by the way, sometimes, is just the cohomology of Z, okay? And the pairing is the usual pairing, the cup product pairing. All right. So I want to form uh, I want to form uh, this collection of maps. So what I do is I give you for each GRD, I give you what's called a virtual cycle. So there's a special cycle inside the cohomology of this moduli space called the virtual cycle, all right? And to get this map, well, these, map, these are maps of marked curves. So um, the markings inside this curve, each marking goes to some point in, in here. So each marking, if I have R markings, I actually get a map. Uh, I get a map from this moduli space down to Z to the R. So I'll write it here. I get an eval what's called an evaluation map to Z to the R based, but based on just taking each marking, uh, taking the value of the R markings as a vector. Okay. So um, I can take a cohomology class. So I have a Kunitz formula, gets me to here. I can uh, take, take the pullback of that cohomology class and land in this moduli space. Then uh, this is for now a black box is that there's something called the virtual cycle, which I'll construct, I'll, I'll tell you about maybe tomorrow, how to construct this for GLSMs, okay? And you, you pair with this thing. Uh, and uh, sorry, you, you cap with this thing and that lands you in the homology of this moduli space, okay? Uh, then um, you have a forgetful map from this moduli space, you can just forget the map and only remember the curve. So that forgetful map lands you, uh, lands you in MGR. Let's put it there. The forgetful map to uh, MGR bar, which just uh, forgets the map, and remembers the curve, okay? So if I push forward this, uh, homology class along this forgetful map, I get a homology class in MGR bar, which is a nice, uh, smooth, proper Green Mumford stack. Uh, and so Poincaré duality lands you back in the cohomology of that space. So uh, when I go around this whole thing, I, I, I land here. Um, this can be thought of as some kind of transform, right? I, I pull back, tensor with something, and then push forward. So. Any questions? Oh, good. Thanks. Okay. Um, so for FJRW theory, I'll explain uh, less, but I wanna comment that um, in this case, this state space is the sum over G and G of the Jacobian of W restricted to VG, WG. So 
So uh, what does this mean for each for each G? So in their case, G is a billion. Uh, and then for each G, we can take the fixed locus uh, for the subgroup generated by G in that abelian group. Restrict the function and take its critical locus, right? This is the, uh, this is the coordinate ring of this critical locus. Uh, and think about it uh, twisted by a top class. All right. So, so if you like, just think about it as this, as a vector space it's that. Then, um, Von Jarvis Ruan constructed some collections of maps to this moduli space. A cohomological field theory. So that was called uh, FJR, that was the original, sorry, I just put W. That was called FJRW theory, as this was proposed by Wicken. Yeah. Uh, so, okay. So uh, what do I want you to notice about this state space so that uh, we can talk about its generalization? I want you to notice, well, first of all, I'm just going to rewrite it. But I want it to come from the cohomology of something. So this is the, if I, so the assumption is that W is an isolated singularity at the origin. This implies that the critical, the, the partial derivatives of W form a regular sequence, okay? And the Jacobian ring is just the quotient by the partial derivatives. So in other words, the Cajul complex on the, on the partial derivatives resolves, uh, re resolves this ring. So um, this is the sum over G and G of the homology of the Cajul complex on the partial derivatives of W restricted to G2. And then uh, this little thing here has to do with the fact that there's a dual. Okay. So, I mean, if I forget about this and that, so then this is true. Okay. So, why am I telling you this? And then there's one more. Uh, you can get rid of this direct sum. This is actually the homology of what's called the inertia stack of this. G. Now you think of this um, as a global section on this inertia stack. So this inertia stack is actually nothing but the, the disjoint union of these spaces. So saying it's a direct sum is, oh, it's the homology of a disjoint union of these spaces. No, nothing deep is happening there. And then this is naturally actually a complex on that disjoint union, which restricts to these bits. Okay. So this is just a way of uh, writing this thing as the homology of some complex on some space. 
Okay. And why do we like that? Well, that's also the homology of uh, uh, the usual, well, first let me say, uh, in general, if I'm given a space and a function, then I can form what's called the twisted Hodge complex. So, sorry, uh, am I supposed to go and tell for another five minutes or for another 15 minutes? Technically another five. Um, another five, okay, no problem. So a yeah. uh, twisted Hodge complex. We haven't had many questions. The explanations have been very clear. So, so if you want, want to go a little further now, um, you're, you're welcome. Okay, I'll try to find a natural stopping point. So um, sorry about that. So given a space and a function on the space, there's what's called the twisted Hodge complex. So that looks like this. So I have the structure sheaf and I have the cotangent bundle. So this is some smooth space. And um, I can wedge with DW. Like DW is an element of this sheaf of Taylor differentials. I'm just taking one to DW, okay? But I can keep doing that. Until I get to the top wedge of the potential button. So this is called the twisted Hodge complex. And notice that if W equals zero, I'm just gonna write the same thing with zeros. This is kind of a silly complex, right? Uh, then in this case, if I take the hyper cohomology of this complex, the zero differential, well, we know these are the Hodge numbers on this case. So really I'm just taking the sum of the homologies of these different sheaves, that those are Hodge numbers. All right, on the other hand, uh, if W is, so if I have the quantum singularity, if W is an isolated singularity and uh, wedge to W is regular, well, this implies wedge DW is regular. So then this is a Cajul complex. Actually, it's the dual of a Cajul complex. This, this is now a regular section of this vector bundle. So it's the Cajul complex on that reg regular section, which would usually be contraction. So since it's wedge, uh, that, that makes it dual. So in fact, in this case, this twisted Hodge complex W is nothing but the Cajul complex on DW. I changed my notation from my notes. Partial I W. Dual. Just because I'm wedging instead of contracting. And uh, as we saw, in this case, the hypercohomology. So, since I'm an affine space, the hypercohomology of this complex, since the space is affine, is just the homology of this complex. Which we saw was the Jacobian.
and then add CW. This is Omega, actually. Sorry about that. Top form. So it's, <laughs> it's the basis of this uh, line number. Makes sense on this app space. Okay. So now rank one. <laughs> it's a free module of rank one. Okay. But th this kind of keeps track because we have a G action. This keeps track of the the representation, the G, the one-dimensional G representation. All right. Any questions about that? So uh, the takeaway was that the hypercohomology of the twisted Hodge complex specializes to uh, the gromov witten state space and the FJRW state space. So uh, it's pretty, uh, I, I think you can guess what I'm going to say next, which is that that's how we define uh, the state space for a general GLSM. So now if I'm just given uh, this data, V, G, theta, W, I can define this thing. The hypercohomology, which I wanted to motivate a bit, uh, of uh, well, the inertia stack on this GIT quotient together with wedge dw. And uh, there is a Kunith formula for this, so that if I take the R tensor power, I get the hy hypercohomology of the arc tensor power, our arc power of this thing. And I put a copy of W on each power of this thing. W is a function from some space to C, W sum to the R is the function from the arc power of that space to C, which is the same function on each, <laughs> each the, the sum of the vector of that function. Any questions? I've got one, but I'll, I'll wait till uh, to, to the end. Is what we'll take okay, it. I think uh, I'm almost out of time. Uh, so I, I, I guess I'm not at a natural stopping point, but I think I should stop soon. So uh, let me say, uh, I'll remind you of this. Uh, so I'll just say in words a few things. So um, I want to define, uh, yeah, eventually I want to define a virtual cycle. I think it's better to leave it till next time, but I, I want to find maps from this thing, right? Given a GLSM, I want to find maps from this thing to, uh, to the cohomology of M. GR bar, and I'll and I'll tell you more about that next. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, are there any questions from the online audience? We'll take uh, questions from the room. So, so that that was beautifully explained. Um, I, I I had a conceptual question about um, th this complex um, and and getting getting things like Hodge numbers. Um, and and I, I'm sorry, it's it's sort of coming in physics language. The, this feels very much like a B model thing. Um, and if your um, if your target is compact or if you're in a GLSM. And the, and the quotient is compact, uh, that, that would be just as a vector space, that would be the same space 
I, I guess here you're saying, like, look, look the, the sum of HPQs, if X is compact, uh, is, is the same as, as quantum cohomology. Um, but it's somehow just getting an isomorphism as a vector space uh, feels like it's, it's missing something. And I, I would have somehow expected to see here like, cohomology of some perverse sheaf on X. Um, defined by that super potential, like a sheaf of vanishing cycles, and in, instead of this complex. Um, um, yeah, there's, I don't know uh, exactly what to say. There's so, you can also take, I mean, you can also take the Durand differential here, right? Yeah, that's more what I would have expected. Yeah, so uh, it turns out we don't do that, but it is the case that um, you know, the there's there's a degeneration of the spectral sequence when you put Durham that tells you that uh, that cohomology actually agrees with. But this is nothing because here there's no spectral sequence. The differential is zero, right? And uh, I now I'm just saying. I can define this Hodge number HPQ as the P homology of wedge Q. So this is this one is uh, HP of wedge Q. Maybe P and Q are, are reversed. Yeah. I, so. This is this this is a trivial complex, right? So so if I take its hyper cohomology, I've done nothing. I'm just taking the the sums of the homologies of each of the sheaves in it. Sorry, that maybe that didn't answer your question at all. <laughs> no, I'm I, I just I, I'm just really I'm uh, it's. I, the space is isomorphic. I'm just surprised that it th that this is the right definition that's going to feed in to some statement oh. about the A meeting. Um, but uh, but I'll, I'll wait till till next time. Okay. Um, yeah, anyway, uh, th th thanks thanks very much again. Um, okay. Have, have have a great day, and we'll sign off for for the evening. Oh, sorry, one more comment, uh, David. Uh, do you think you can uh, send the slides to us uh, so that we can put it up online or share it with the participants? Oh yeah, sure. Uh, so we can put it up online? Uh, yes, no problem. I'll get them to you. I'll, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll get to where we, where we got because they're not filled in uh, in other places. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Okay.